what are cryptocurrencies? What are NFTs? Time to buy Bitcoin. Buy and hold. Time to sell to whales. Decentralized finance, smart contract, white paper. Well then buy it. Well then sell it. I don't know. To the moon. One of the most fascinating things about blockchain and crypto is how they transcend finance in so many different ways. It seems that every single sector will eventually be disrupted by this technology. Music and entertainment certainly won't be left aside. The music sector faces quite a few challenges, and although the internet allowed for massive scalability and growth, it did so at a price. Artists have limited agency over how they release or monetize their creations, and users are stuck in wall gardens in which they pay for things they can't own. Between them, big tech companies who are seemingly reinforcing and benefiting from the status quo they created. But could there be another way? Well, it seems like it. From Paris, this is your host, Moel Said, and you're listening to On The Ledger. Today, I'm excited to welcome two very special guests who are actively building the future of the music industry. First, we have Cooper Turley. Cooper is a Web3 creative mind and frontrunner. He discovered crypto while doing a music business degree, before experimenting with the technology and is now actively participating in the new creator economy, contributing to projects such as FWB, Pleaser DAO, Rock Social Token, The Defiant, but most importantly, Audius, where he leads the crypto strategy to create a new decentralized music streaming model, connecting artists directly to fans. We'll be joined by Parker Todd Brooks. Parker was born and raised in the music industry. He held notable positions in companies such as Topspin Media, Beats Music, and Apple Music, where he headed the dance and electronic music artist relations and worked on innovative revenue share models for artists. To further develop his vision, Parker joined Ledger this year as VP NFTs, where he'll focus on bringing non-fungibles and self-custody to benefit the artists' communities. Quite an inspiring conversation ahead, so let's get this going. On the Ledger, episode 10, Music and the Era of Decentralization and NFTs, here we go! Cooper, Parker, welcome to On The Ledger. How are you doing? Or have you recovered from ECC? <laughs> oh yeah, feeling great. Yeah, feeling really good. It's pretty warm in Paris this week, but it's, uh, it's, it's been it's pretty, it was pretty amazing in ECC. Great. So let me try and set the table here. We've spoken about the creator economy before on the show, and it seems like it's the new buzzword in town. But I guess that some people might have a hard time grasping the concept and how it has impacted the music industry. Cooper, you describe yourself as a builder of the creator economy. So where does it come from and how would you simply explain it to a newbie? I would say the creator economy provides new economic tools for any creator to take advantage of, you know, kind of the fan base that they're building and the community they're developing. I think musicians are one of many creators that are benefiting from these new tools. And what I'm doing is trying to help them understand how to use them to their advantage. So let me build on that with another question. Um, Cooper, in your opinion, what did the internet bring to the table with regards to liberating artists and to a certain extent? And what was the flip side? Yeah, I think mass curation, you know, the ability to discover music from anywhere in the world in five seconds and be able to stream it with no barriers to entry was fantastic. You know, the entire world's music discography was at your fingertips. And I think this is really, really beneficial for finding and discovering fans. I think the flip side of that is that when we commoditize music, it was very difficult to establish economic relationships with our fans. And so with crypto, what I'm really excited about is if you have a fan who's super passionate about your project, we now have ways to engage them in a more meaningful level. We're starting to see this now with NFTs and social tokens. And so you take the model of distributing music to anyone in the world, and you can offer tools, benefits, and products on top of that to be able to capture and energize super fans to mobilize your fan base. So let me build on that with another question. If I've got my facts straight, you actually discovered crypto while doing a music business degree, which was a bit of an epiphany to you. Why is that? And how did it shape your future? Yeah, I mean, you asked a little bit about the flip side there. I think that for me, you know, I was doing a degree in music business. I was basically getting put into a system to go and work at a tour management company and be a cog in a machine. You know, I saw this opportunity with crypto to be a little bit more entrepreneurial. And granted, I had always loved music, but I don't think... Uh, Anyone can agree it's a very tough business financially to work in. And so for me, being able to find a new outlet to go and kind of understand new technology, understand a new path forward for artists, it was a really freeing experience. You know, and I'm very lucky to have found my way back to it. But I think we do need to recognize that it's very, very early on in crypto. It's still extremely complicated. And so I've been lucky enough to work with creators who are willing to take that leap of faith. But I still think there's a ton of work we need to do to be able to help other creators use these tools to their advantage in a very easy way. Definitely. 
So let me move on to Parker. Parker, you were at the forefront of the digital transformation of the music industry. Um, why did you choose to leave Web2 behind and join the Web3 revolution? What drove it home for you? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. So it, it Apple Music, so I was a part of a team that what we did is we co-invented technologies to identify mass recordings um, with DJ mixes or within DJ mixes and then um, directly pay the rights holders. And what I realized is, is that what we invented at Apple um, for DJ mixes had like a, ha had an incredible life. And, and, and what it showed was, was that like there was an appetite, even though it was like a small one for Sony, Universal, Warner, and the Merlin Trade Group to recognize that there's real value in being able to create derivative works with master recordings. Um, and for the, the DJ who created the work, plus the entities from the clubs, the festivals and promoters to also get paid. And, but there was also like a hard line where, where that kind of thinking stopped and that, and that it, for me, It was like the idea of that we would solve this problem of allowing artists to create derivative works and for both the artists and underlining rights holders to get paid was always related to how do we take it from 30 minutes down to three? And that was, you know, a mouthful too big for most people to accept was possible. And I, when I looked out and when Ian joined Ledger, it became very clear to me that this idea that we're, we're actually, we have the ability for the first time, or I do, I do, I do personally have the ability to sit at the table with Cooper and with you and the other people decide how these technologies are created and how then they're delivered to these communities. I realized that, that like there was an opportunity to take that idea that we could create derivative works in a 30 minute way and we could actually actually condense it down to three minutes. And I believe, you know, that there is a future where the idea that that how music is created and it's remixed and it's redistributed. Um, I firmly believe that there's a group of people today and there'll be new people that come in are going to solve it. Um, and it's going to revolutionize how, how music is consumed, how music is created, and how everybody in the supply chain gets compensated. So that was a big reason that I joined. I, I, I felt like that there's just like a massive opportunity to, to create massive change um, and be a part of, you know, in particular, the music revolution. That's very inspiring. And maybe speaking about massive change, Cooper, Audius is described as a decentralized music platform owned and governed by the creator, which is a massive change. Um, basically, a platform that puts creators first. Um, maybe maybe speak more to the reason behind that and how um, Audius differs from, say, you know, uh, Spotify or Apple Music. Totally. I'll first double click on what Parker was saying there. I think that the ethos of crypto is very much open source. It's very collaborative and positive sum in nature. So irregardless of the platform we're talking about, I think you see across the board, people release technology and they share it with one another to be able to benefit together. And I think that underlying feeling is what we saw with music specifically in the electronic sector that made it so popular. So to give a, a cool uh, analogy about Audius, you know, SoundCloud was responsible for breaking dozens of artists 2013, 2014, 2015. You know, these DJs made a huge presence online on the back of SoundCloud. They're releasing remixes. They're releasing DJ mixes. They blew up and they were able to start going on tour and selling tickets. You know, they created millions of dollars of value for the platform. But unfortunately, the only people who saw that upside were the co-founders and the team at SoundCloud when they raised a $700 million valuation. You know, with Audius, we wanted to change that and basically say, what if when Audius is popular and artists make a career on the back of it, you know, that upside was captured by the people who actually created the value. So the artists and the listeners and the fans themselves. And so to give a quick uh, overview on Audius, as you mentioned, decentralized streaming pl platform, all the content that you see is hosted in a decentralized node ecosystem, which means that it's unstoppable. Audius as a company does not control any of this data. They're not responsible for it being able to come to life. And more specifically, we create artist to fan relationships. You know, you see quick glimpses of this in platforms like Spotify, but You know, if I want to figure out who my fans are and who I need to reach and who I want to engage, it's very difficult. You know, on most of these platforms, you actually have to pay to even be able to reach your own following online. And so with Audius, what we want to create 
is tools and on ramps for artists to be able to build deep relationships with their fans and use Web3 tools to be able to do that in a really, really seamless way. That's fascinating. And speaking of, you know, uh, digital ownership and NFTs, um, it's clear that NFTs um, have, you know, significantly clear benefit for the creator. But what about the user? Uh, in your opinion, um, you know, Cooper is fan engagement. You were speaking about uh, fan engagement. Um, how is it going to evolve? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I can speak to this as someone who's been avidly collecting NFTs from musicians. You know, I think that building a deeper relationship with the creator is something that every fan wishes to have. You know, so far, we haven't been able to identify good ways to do that. You see Twitch streams and Patreon is kind of the closest parallels, but those almost cap out because you're in a world with so many other people trying to fight for the same attention. And so for the artist to fan relationships in Web3, you know, I think namely NFTs and the ability to purchase work at an you know, on set value, you can bid 100 ETH on the piece and sell someone that they changed your life and absolutely made made their day. Like that's something that I found really, really effective. You know, I now own about 10 different music NFTs that all come with some sort of redemption rights to shows, VIP for life, all access for life, you know, one-on-one -on -one studio sessions. And it's really just amazing the, the relationships I've built with the creators I love solely because I collected their NFTs. I think that this is like a very early stand it, and I think that we're going to start to see access levels being defined more clearly using things like NFT, social tokens, governance, and all kind of the cool things that we're very familiar with in crypto today. Parker, as VP of NFTs at Ledger, what's your vision for the role of NFTs um, and Ledger products, of course, in, in the creator economy? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a pretty vast question. And, uh, you know, what I think is immediate is very, is very much like what Cooper touched on, is that I think that where this goes is that we're creators are going to start to create a a connection with fans that that can be proven without avoidance of doubt that people can actually show and prove that they own a digital asset and then i think from there there's going to be a number of services and companies and artists themselves that are going to start to create experiences um that are tied to and directly tied to owning those digital assets. Um, and I think that what you're going to start to see is, is that, you know, out of the gate, like what we see today is like, like a lot of times when, when I hear about experiences or I say experiences to people, like a lot of people like immediately go to, Oh, like a meet and greet with an artist. And I, and I think that's just one piece of the puzzle. I think that like there's going to be a, a digital DNA that's created and 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 as people become more educated on on how it works and how they can actually start to create this for themselves, I think that there's gonna the brands are gonna really catch on to this idea. And it's not just brands, but artists, brands, institutions, and they're gonna start to realize that they're gonna be able through this collection of assets that people own, they're gonna be able to identify people, and they're actually not need to know who they are. And they're going to be able to provide access to these people to experiences that otherwise they wouldn't be able to provide. Um, I, I, it, I think it's going to be really, really, really immense. It's fascinating. Yeah, I'll add on there uh, really quick too. I think um, ownership is going to be really key. You know, right now you collect NFTs, the relationship with the creator. Something that I'm really looking forward to and actively working on is what does it mean to have ownership rights to a song or an album because you own the NFT? You know, I think right now there's some people experimenting with it, but it's my belief yeah. over the next five years, owning an NFT will entitle you to ownership benefits that we've never seen in the music industry before. Um, yeah, th that's an interesting point. And Parker, you and I speak often about ownership, but also about, about self-custody and the importance of, of, of such, of you know, of basically truly owning your digital assets. Could you maybe speak more to that and how you think it will evolve in the future uh, with regards to artists' communities, uh, learning about self-custody and also about ownership in a more general sense? Yeah, so th I think what's going to happen long-term is, is that there's some like really key principles of blockchain technology and decentralization that are unknown today. Um, and one of those is, is what it means to actually self-custody and own your digital assets. And I think what's going to happen in the near future, um, and I think long term, is that you're going to start to see massive, massive education um, for all types of communities. And I think I think there's going to be a massive effort to to educate communities that have been marginalized by the digital divide to date. And the reason that is is that when we what I think is going to happen is is that when we start to 
educate people what it means to actually own digital assets and what it means to actually custody those assets and actually be the owner of them. Um, what happens is, is that they're able to then look at like, well, what is self-custody um, with the hardware wallet versus what is a custodian versus what is a, a, a software wallet that is not secure? And one, they're going to be able to start to make informed decisions about how they actually, the reasons why and how they actually store these digital assets. I think... What's also going to happen is, is that with this education, we're actually going to start to make devices. And I think it's, it's not just us. Like if you look at, if you look at what, what Jack's doing at Square and a number of others, is that, is that a number of institutions have raised their head and hand and said, this is, this is really hard. Like, like having a wallet, a hardware wallet and the setup and the, and the security that provides is really, really hard. And so, and what's going to happen, I think, is that we're going to start to make this simpler and simpler and simpler. And there's a future where that like vis-a-vis -vis education around what it means to self-custody assets plus ease of use is going to open up a whole inter, uh, a, a suite of businesses that'll provide experiences. And so like, the, like I see a future where it's like, you know, like kind of to what we talked about and what Cooper spoke about is that like, it's going to be really easy for people to create fan experiences that require a hardware wallet to verify that you actually are a member of the fan club, or you're going to be able to go, for instance, Cooper runs a company or runs an organization called FWB. They just recently released a ticketing platform and it's an early beta, but there's going to be a day where you're actually, they're going to be actually to release tickets and you show up to an FWB event and it'd be super seamless to walk in and get into the event and prove that you actually own a digital asset to, that grants you access. Um, so that's kind of what I see it as. As I see there's three parts is that there's going to be education about what it means to self-custody. The software and hardware is going to get really, really simple to use. And then there's going to be companies and services that build frictionless experiences around that ease of use. So now that we've spoken about the past and the present and a little bit about the future, but we'll dive more into the future of cryptocurrency. This is the ledger forecast. So Cooper, if Web3 is to succeed, it needs mass adoption. But to Parker's earlier point, the user experience and language uh, of the current uh, crypto sphere is a bit intimidating to newbies. Um, how are you working on gaining such adoption with audience, but also with friends with benefits? And maybe speak to how you see it evolving in the future. Yeah, so the clearest parallel here is for audience, you don't need to know anything about crypto to get started. You log in with an email and a password and under the hood, you have an Ethereum wallet baked into your account. I think that more products are going to be built with this mindset where you kind of start in an easy mode where you have something set up for you. And if you want to evolve to advanced mode, you can connect while like MetaMask. For something like FWB, I think trying to think about what it means to join a fan community. You know, right now, this is setting up a Discord account, joining a server, and then connecting a wallet. Um, to someone like me, that's extremely easy. But to most people, they've never used Discord before. And so thinking about how to pull out that experience of joining a chat group and then connecting a wallet that has digital assets in it I believe there will be products to make this easier, but I'm very much looking forward to that. You know, I think that recognizing that uh, crypto is so difficult and hard is really, really important. One thing I've been doing is trying to run experiments that don't have financial economic value tied to them. So for example, POOPs are NFTs that you collect for going to IRL or digital events. Uh, this past weekend in New York, I was lucky enough to work with an artist named Tycho. We set up a POOP, we handed them out at the concert. If you went to the event, you could collect basically a digital ticket stub it has no secondary market value, but it did allow us to kind of get the flywheel rolling on identifying fans who have crypto wallets. And so, you know, running small experiments like that, I think are going to get us somewhere meaningful over the long term. And right now, a lot of the work that I do is looking at these complex onboarding solutions and trying to figure out how to really, really dumb it down to make it really easy to join for anyone, regardless of their prior experience. I think that's a pretty interesting point. And, and, and so let, let me piggyback on that. Like, Mo, this is a, this is a big thing that, like, kind of what Cooper talked on, uh, talked about is, like, this idea of intrinsic value of NFTs. I actually also see a future where, like, every single physical item that you buy comes with a digital collectible. I think there's going to be two physical or two digital items that are actually basically tied to any physical product. 
is that there's going to be a digital asset, which is proof of origin. And it like kind of talks about where the product was made, who made the product, what CDZ it was made in. And, and that's going to be created as it comes off the supply chain. And then I think that there's also going to be this digital asset that has nothing to do with speculation, right? That's just tied to the physical good. So in the case of like Doc Martin, I see and or Nike or Givenchy. I think that there's a in the very, very near future, what you're going to see is that every single product comes off the line is going to have a proof of origin NFT, but it's also going to have a digital collectible component. So I think this is going to be a huge opportunity for, for, for brands and for creators that create these, you know, like, you know, my, the brands I'm thinking about are like Givenchy, Gucci, LVMH, Kering brands, right? They're going to have a huge opportunity to start to look at, you know, all of these companies that are coming up and go, hey, how can you take our original asset, our original digital collectible that actually ties into these products and help expand our reach into these new universes um, that we don't know how to actually connect with? That's a very interesting point. And with everything that you've been exploring now, um, what do you think the music industry will look like in 10 years? <laughs> bringing the subject a little bit back to music. Oh, because... yeah, that's really interesting. Well, I, I actually, I see a few, I see this future. Um, and, and Cooper, please argue with me if you think this is, is that I think that, that the idea that there's a play button and that that's how people consume music is over and dead. Um, I think that the future of the way that music consumed will be programs like GarageBand. And I see a future where when you use those programs, um, it'll be as easy as drag and drop to take a Beatles stem, a Jay-Z stem, and put it into GarageBand. And when you play and you create music, the creators are going to get paid. And I think it's from that point and from that step forward, I also see a future where not only do the creators get paid when you when you're making the music, that it's going to be as simple as a single click, and it's in the cloud, and everybody can listen to it. And not only does do the underlying rights holders, but the person that helped create this new derivative works gets paid. Um, and with all of that, I also see a future where there is no releases. I think the releases from a marketing mechanic are actually incredibly valuable to build to build a like a noise and, and an audience around a piece of work that's that's about to come out makes a whole lot of sense for most artists. But I also see a future where me, you, Cooper, we walk into a studio, um, we drag some stems from the cloud, the artists get paid while we're creating it. We actually make some creations on our own. Um, we then take out our hardware wallets. We mint the song and it's live before we walk out of the studio. Like I actually think that's a future that's actually really close. Um, and I think it's probably, you know, if it happens in 10 years, that's cool. But I think it's probably going to happen within the next five. Wow. Cooper, what do you think? It's the first time I've ever heard of someone predicting the play button will be uh, uh, gone forever. It's definitely a very ambitious prediction there. <laughs> I think on my end, um, recognizing that fan communities are going to be a lot more empowered in 10 years is really, really important. So if I find an artist really early on in their life cycle, I should be able to participate in that upside. I think what that sets is a precedent where fans are working directly for artist communities. And we're going to see a disintermediation where labels are now not the only one doing these services. You have your super fans basically working for you and having shared economic upside in that activity. What that happens in 10 years then is once you establish a precedent for anyone to own these different pieces of work is these creators getting much more powerful about the way that they influence the platforms that they release on. So right now, instead of being beholden to an algorithm like you have on Spotify, I think we're going to start to see these digital nation states where artists have these huge followings. They're going around to different platforms. They're playing shows in different cities. They're having you know local concerts in cities that they set up themselves. We're going to start to see these pockets where if you're a big fan for an artist, you can come in and work for them, own a piece of the project. And as a result, I think the derivative value of that is going to be 10 times higher than anything that we see today. Yeah, I think, yeah, the future is all about community and, and, and then decentralization. And I think talking about the future, I have a question to both of you um, and you feel free to go first on this one. Um, what is the future innovation that you're most excited about? Uh, the challenge here is that you can only choose one uh, and try and give us a quick overview of what it is and how it works or how it will eventually work in the future. 
I'll take a, a first stab at this. So that's okay. Um, I'm really fascinated by splits contracts. You know, I think it's really simple to think that anyone can get any percentage of a royalty in real time conceptually, but it's very difficult to do this in practice. So you see this very high level right now on platforms like Mirror and Foundation. You'll have a 50-50 split between the artist that owns uh, the, the release and the person who helped them create it. I think in the future, we're going to see splits contracts where there's a thousand to 10,000 artists of any given cent that comes into a specific asset and being able to route that around the world in real time is the single biggest innovation that the music industry needs to be able to, to you know, proliferate and exist in the future. I love that. So uh, it's time to move on to the last segment of the show. This is a tip for crypto first grade. So um, let me start with Cooper. Uh, what is your ultimate moral story? One that would allow a creative crypto first grader to have a better time navigating Web3 and the creator economy. It could be a moral story or a simple tip, whatever you wish. But uh, I mean, I think everyone would agree that it would be better if it's a story that someone can learn from. Yeah, I'd say um, high level. I owe my entire career to working for DAOs. You know, I had no idea what I was going to do when I came into crypto. I basically saw an industry that was very ripe for innovation and I saw something I was passionate about and I just threw myself headfirst into it. You know, with crypto, I think there's this notion that in order to be involved, you either need to be a really amazing trader who's able to identify economic upside or you need to be highly technical. You know, what I would say as a morale story is if you are skilled at coordination, this industry is begging you to come in and help. You know, every single project that I work for is always looking for people to coordinate one another. And as we get into a deeper decentralized world, people who are able to help with organization and morale boosting internally are going to have extremely valuable roles. So if you're looking for ways to get involved, I would say you don't need to have a prior skill set. My prior skill set was a music business degree, which has no correlation to anything in crypto. And yet I found myself working with some of the brightest people in the world. So don't be intimidated. If you're willing to put in the legwork, I think there's going to be some really amazing opportunities for you. Good one. Parker, what about you? Yeah, that, that's a good question. It's a really good question. I think that, you know, for me, and, and it's very similar, it's along the same lines as Cooper's, is I think that like, the easiest way for anyone to add value is to work in service of artists and especially in this space. And I think that like the mindset of, of how can this technology be used to benefit artists, to allow them to one, maintain ownership of their works, maintain agency of their works, and connect with their fans in ways never before possible. Like, I mean, th this is, it, it's not simple, but the idea is simple. The idea is, is, is if the technology, like when you look at it, like if you come into this space and you look at how can I serve art and artists maintain agency, I, 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 there is no limit to the success. Because every single artist on the planet today, every single one, needs someone at the table looking out for their best interest. And I think that that's a, you know, for as long as I've been in this space, there's a lot of really great people, but the people that stand out the most to me are the ones that like, they're like Cooper. That's just like, how do we, how do we build this so that the, the future's better and that artists can connect in ways and, and have a way of life that wasn't, possible before this technology existed i guess that's the perfect way to end it cooper parker thank you for the inspiring thoughts and the glimpse into the future of music and entertainment it was great chatting with you thanks for having me on i look forward to yeah. doing it again as well yeah man thanks mo thanks coop thanks man that's it hope you guys enjoyed this as much as i did this was the last episode of under ledger before a short summer break we'll be back very soon with more inspiring discussions and a few surprises in the meantime Feel free to subscribe to this podcast, listen to previous episodes, and share it around if that's what you're into. If you want to dive deeper, you can read Ledger Academy on World School of Block as well. Brought to you by Ledger, directed and edited by Theo Wiesmann. This was on the Ledger from Paris. See you in September. Take care. Au revoir. This content is provided for informational purposes only and is the sole expression of our opinion and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, tax advice, or more generally, any type of advice. Ledger will not be responsible for the consequences of reliance upon any opinion or statement contained in this podcast or any omission. Crypto assets are volatile. You should be fully aware of the level of risk involved before engaging in any crypto-related activities, and you should consult your own advisors as to those matters. References to any securities 
or digital assets or for illustrative purposes only and do not constitute an investment recommendation or offer to provide investment advisory services. Please note that any loss of data, crypto assets or profit is your sole responsibility.